Okay, so <clears throat> as we do once a month, we are going to go through our Q&A questions for the live stream or for a Q&A night. And then we have a special guest that we're going to call up and just talk about some current events, see how that goes. And <clears throat> so I get my phone because sometimes people ask me questions on the phone. And what do we have here? So, great question. It says, Jewish rules and laws, no working on the Sabbath, don't eat dairy and meat together, don't eat pork, don't eat crab, sacrifice for sins, etc. Jesus died for sins, so sacrifices of animals are no longer needed. Do all the other rules still apply? Can a Jew, actually a Jewish believer is asking this question, can a Jew believing in Jesus eat pork, or is that still considered a sin? Thanks. So <clears throat> there were laws, there were rules, there were um, dietary laws, there were um, ceremonial laws, there were civil, legal, like God had this whole network set up uh, in the Old Testament. Uh, there were laws of hygiene, which kept, kept the people safe and free from contaminants and plagues and such. As a matter of fact, the Jewish people did very well uh, during the major European plague because their practices were more um, clean and hygienic than what everybody else was doing because the Jewish people were more adhering to the scripture. Now, of course, there are some things in there that we could still use. As a matter of fact, uh, the whole COVID thing, right? Uh, but actually, if you look at Leviticus and look at the Old Testament, uh, they didn't lock the whole village down. So we're doing something very different than what's been done for thousands of years. But there were people that were quarantined if they were symptomatic, right? Before they went to the priest to be examined, you know, there was a, a quarantine period. They were certain they had to cover their face. They had to alert other people that they were infectious. So it's very interesting before the electron microscope, of the eight, late 1800s, um, the Bible for thousands of years had it right. Um, so the, if you look at the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, that really is the thing that, you know, these, a lot of, remember J J Christianity started as a sort of a Jewish sect, that's what they say, but it was Jewish people that believed in their Messiah. And, you know, then the Gentiles started coming into the church here we see it the other way around. After thousands of years, it's largely Gentiles and not as many Jewish people just because of the sheer numbers. So it's, it's a reference point. But <clears throat> the, the big concern was for somebody to become a believer, what did they have to do? And pretty much God did a new thing. Jesus fulfilled the law, but uh, he also when he fulfilled the law, especially in the animal sacrifices, those weren't needed anymore because they were a, 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 a type of Jesus to come. So when he fulfilled it, there was no reason to do all those things in the temple anymore. A lot of the offerings Jesus fulfilled in himself, um, bringing him and us and God together, right? And some of the offerings were designed to do that, but when Jesus came, you know, he pretty much tore the, the veil between the Holy of Holies and the holy place, so it was a picture of, you know, God being closer to man through Jesus Christ. And when they write this thing in Acts 15, you should check it out. So to answer, the simple answer is for a Jewish believer, if you're looking to have um, bacon tomorrow morning, uh, the answer is you can. <laughs> so uh, a lot of those dietary laws and stuff, there's very few things that were actually left that the Jerusalem Council came to and said, hey, you should probably follow these things. Um, but again, you could, you could work on Saturday, you could eat pork. Um, a lot of the things, especially that were a type of Christ, don't have to be done anymore. First of all, the temple's not there anymore anyway. Uh, but Jesus fulfilled those and you'd be going backwards. So actually, if you look at all of these different rules and laws, you can see something about what God did through Christ in them. Um, but anyway, they say in, in Acts 15, he says, uh, very simple, uh, verse 28, for it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you. Now, remember, this was because Gentiles were coming in and the Judaizers were saying, 
Gentiles had to become Jews first and then become Christians. There were all these steps. And God was saying, no, just believe in Christ. Um, but if the Gentiles had some practices that were a little abhorrent, these things they should see as a guideline. So verse 28, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay upon you no greater burden than those necessary things, that you abstain from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled, from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well, farewell. So there you have it. That's why the Bible is beautiful, because it pretty much gives us the answers to everything. Now, please raise your hand. Um, if you have a follow-up question, they have the portable mic. We're just going to go back to the way we did it before, where people could j jump in, my pastors could jump in, a question, a follow-up question. So if, you, if you'd like to do that, just let us know. Now, that actually brings us to my next question, which is another question that somebody asked, different person. It said to, you know, to keep from sexual immorality. There was a lot of sexual immorality in Greco-Roman culture. And in 1 Corinthians, right, God tells the married couple, you know, that, well, your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and when you join to your mate, right, husband and wife, you're one flesh. So to go outside of that relationship to uh, houses of prostitution or there was an adulterous situation in 1 Corinthians, you're, you're defiling the marriage covenant and you're defeating the idea of the whole one flesh. So the question that came in as I was walking in this evening was, why so much about purity in the scripture? Why so much about purity? God has his reasons for everything. And a lot of the, the reasons for purity, obviously they're spiritual reasons, right? So, you know, he says, Paul, the Apostle Paul says that a, you know, a man or a woman who engages with a prostitute is, you know, now becoming one with that person and then one with another one. And you can't really be one with a whole bunch of people. It's not a party, you know. Uh, man and woman, one flesh, there you go. Uh, the other thing was, and when you talk about purity, probably for the gentleman who asked was, um, even think about drugs, you know, drugs and alcohol, getting drunk, getting high. Um, there's also another issue there. You're, you're numbing a part of your brain or you're, you're loosening your inhibitions. And quite frankly, um, I know people who are involved in the occult and they would use drugs. And drugs would be a gateway to allow demonic beings to come into that person's life. So... Drugs do very interesting thing to the brain, you know, the psyche, and also the spirit. Uh, so again, why, why all the purity? Does it mean you can't have a beer with dinner or a glass of wine? No, it doesn't mean that. But I always say this, if you can't, if you don't know the difference between one beer and 15, you probably have a problem and shouldn't drink. You know what I'm saying? Um, before I was a Christian, I was one of those people that, that couldn't figure out the difference, and it just made my life a misery my relationships, et cetera. So, um, so when you talk about purity, whether it's uh, drugs and alcohol, whether it's sexual immorality, there's a reason for all of these things. So I, I chatted a lot. Does anybody want to jump in or add something? Or Roberta? Oh, you had to ask me the hard question, right? <laughs> no, but that's, that is a great question. You know, the concubines and this and that. Um, let's see how, how, how much I remember. Is it Leviticus 17.17 17 or, or 1 Kings 7? Something 17.17. 17. The scripture told, especially the kings, not to multiply their wives. So here you have God saying, if somebody could find that, that would be great. Something 17.17. 17. Um, <laughs> and... <clears throat> And basically, you know, God had to tell the most powerful people who could pretty much do what they want. Of course, they have to answer to God. But they were at the top of the food chain. Don't do this. I don't like it. And they were also, some of these kings, a lot of them, they had multiple women. And they couldn't be one with a person when they just kept, one night it's this one, the next night it's that one. So God specifically um, put that out there. Don't do that. But they did it, right? God said, don't murder, but they murdered. God said, don't steal, but they stole, you know? So when people say, 
well, God condones it because it's in the Bible. Be careful with that one. I'm, I'm not, I know you're not saying that. The Bible records history as ugly as that history is. It doesn't mean God condoned it. As a matter of fact, David, King David, I believe, if you look at his life, a lot of his, a lot of his troubles in, in midlife and later were because he didn't listen to God, and specifically because he had all these women. It caused problems with his sons. There was rebellion within his, his had sons killing sons, son raping a, 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 one of his daughters. I mean, it was insane. And then Absalom tried to overthrow his own father, and David had to leave Jerusalem. So that was a direct result of David not listening. You know, but it's a great question. And hey, I could speak for myself, and I'm sure everybody here, if we just would listen to God and follow the Scripture, wouldn't our lives be a lot easier? You know what I'm saying? So that's, that's a great point. Anybody want to jump in on that? That's it. I knew it was something 1717. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So a few more in here. I'll find my favorite question because it's extremely simple and extremely genuine and it, it just says everything. The question is, how do I communicate or talk to God? Love that question. Well, prayer is the way we talk to God. Prayer is our communication with God. And sadly enough, me being in, when I was young, in a denomination, um, prayer was memorize this prayer, say it to God ten times. Jesus told us right in Matthew, don't do that. <laughs> because th with the same intellect God gave us to communicate with each other, he also wants us to communicate with him. So how do I have a conversation with Pastor Sam and we spend an hour fellowshipping and talking and then I go to God and say, Lord, how you doing? Lord, how you doing? Lord, how you doing? You'd be like, what are you <laughs> saying to me? You know, it doesn't make sense. So those memorized prayers are pretty much doing that. Communication with God, prayer is... You could do it with other people. I've prayed, we just prayed in my office, Pastor Sam, Pastor Vinny, and, and I, um, asking the Lord to help us through this session, answer the questions. Um, you can also do it. I like to do it when I'm alone. I just like to walk down the street and, and talk to the Lord, and, you know, just like I'm talking to you. Um, praise Him for, what he, for who He is. Thank Him for what He's done in my life. Ask Him to forgive my sins. And then just chat about whatever, you know, um, just looking at this world, uh, the challenges, the challenges facing the church. So my prayers are, my prayers are, Lord, help us as leaders to, to do what's right by you and the people. Um, if you're a new believer, you might have awkward prayers. You might stumble over your prayers. You might wonder, is this going anywhere? You know, how do I know God's hearing me? But you get the hang of it. You start to have that relationship with him, and he confirms things in your life. So simple question, extremely powerful. Anybody have anything to add to that? Yes, Luba. Well, it's, it's different. It's, it's, I mean, it's a great question. It's, different. it's a difference between memorizing something that's wrote that has really no meaning behind it versus when Jesus speaks about the parable of the persistent widow where he asks us to keep coming before the Lord 
It's not like it's, it's rote and it means nothing. It's, Lord, you know, I really love this person. I really see them suffering. I really want to see them healed. And you go to the Lord every day for months. Um, I think that that's perfectly legitimate. Um, you know, I look at our culture and our world. You know, when my wife and I, I mean, I pray by myself. She does. We pray different times of the day. Uh, but at night... You know, I just know that when we go to bed, I, I, and usually in the morning too, we just pray for our country. We pray for the world. We pray for the unbelievers. We pray for a great harvest that, God, that the Lord brings into his kingdom before he returns. So our, we have a burden for the lost. And somebody, you could pray for them, and three months later they get healed. Um, the lost is always going to be a burden until the Lord returns. So, and I'm not saying one's better than the other. I'm just saying that, you know, I think it, you, you reflect the heart of God when you come to him about somebody who's suffering or somebody who's not saved and doesn't realize what they're doing with their life. Um, and those are legitimate, you know. And, and I don't, you know, Jesus taught us how to pray, our Father who art in heaven. There's elements to that prayer. But if, if I every day, when I go look up to heaven, I go, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, they will be thy Our Father who art in heaven. I'm not saying anything. I'm repeating. So that's what he means, Jesus, when he said those rote prayers versus just sharing your heart with the Lord. As, you know, God is a person. He's God, and he's way above us, but he is a person. And when he made us in his image, God can reason and we can reason. So it's kind of cool that even though we're sinners, you can see that he wants the same reasoning he put into us that he, he possesses, that he wants us to, to have that relationship with him. Paul, you had to jump in there? No, I was just going to say one thing. Oh. Part of the question because okay, so that's what... If you could give me like 10 seconds to get to that, I'll get to Yes, so that's what I'll do. You know, we... we with the, with the lockdowns and, oh, we're just live stream now that on Wednesday nights we're not live stream anymore <coughs> or Sundays. But, you know, so the way we used to do it is I got to get used to going back to the old way was somebody asks a question for the people who are on live stream who didn't hear the question. I have to repeat the question. So point taken. Anybody else? Question? Hands up? I think it's cool in the scriptures that... Um you know, you have Peter walking on the water and then starting to sink, and basically he's going, help. You have the thief on the cross talking to Jesus, you know, uh, remember me, you know. You have um, uh, just different examples, like the penitent sinner in the temple with the tax collector. The tax collector is bragging, and say, oh, I'm glad I'm not like this poor soul. And the sinner is just so humble. So God knows our heart. Uh, the length of the prayer is not as important as the intent of the heart. And I, the things I learned in the last few years is just always finish your prayer, Lord, not, after you give them everything, Lord, not my will, but yours be done. Because it's your heart that counts. Let me answer this one, and then I'll jump in with John. Um, the book of Leviticus talks about the year of Jubilee. What is the year of Jubilee, and why did the Lord institute it? Excellent question. The year of Jubilee was a period of seven sevens after 49 years, right? Seven times seven. There would be, after that, would be like the 50th year or the year of Jubilee. And this was God's way of, now listen, the way we run our country, the way we, you know, Russia, Europe, African countries, mankind does this thing where somebody, these elite entitled people feel that they need to be at the top and when they get at the top they need to tell everybody what to do and don't let them get up where they are sort of like king of the hill in politics and and hierarchy and this you can call it a class system you can call it a caste system but it's you know you know your place you're middle class or lower middle class or poor you know your place but we as the elites are going to control everything including you um, God set up a system that's different he set up a system where somebody could become wealthy, but not at the expense of somebody else. So the, at the 50th year, you, let's say my grandfather made a foolish decision, and he lost a lot of money, and the person who b let him borrow the money says, you got to pay up. And my grandfather's like, I don't have it. 
So my grandfather sells himself into indentured servitude, and then my father is born, and he's, the debt still isn't paid, and he's got to be sold into, and, and now it's my turn. What the year of Jubilee did was, every 50 years, and this is beautiful, God would say, okay, those debts that are accruing interest, and now it's my turn as the grandson to go put myself into, it's into slavery, right? For a time until the debt is paid off. By law, at that 50th year, I believe they blew the horn too. It was very exciting. It was um, a, a festive time, and those debts were canceled. So maybe I, I worked for a, a year, but I was supposed to work for 20 years because it was a big debt. At that 50th year, whoo, after a year, man, I don't have to pay off the rest of those 19 years. And the, God did that. You know, this had to do with land. It had to do with debt. It had to do with a lot of things where he didn't want his people, and of course any Gentiles that came into the system, he didn't want them to have a, a system of perpetual servitude. And boy, if we could um, do that in our country, you know, in other countries, it would be nice. But it, you know, these predatory loans, these credit card loans, um, student debt, student loans, you know, these, these predatory companies, they are predatory. And, you know, you don't realize it. You go sign up for a student loan and you sign on the dotted line and four years go by and you have a degree and maybe you can make 40, 50,000, but you owe like 60 grand plus interest and you may never be able to pay that off. And I think there should be laws, some, uh, this is my personal opinion, I think they need to change the laws because some people graduate high school at 17 or 18 and they're making a huge de uh, decision when they sign on the dotted line and they're predatory. Um, you can see this, but I'm not going to go into, because I, I could do this all night. I was an economics major. Um, God's way is a better way, always, isn't it? You know, he's like, I don't want that for my people. I don't, you know, listen, that family, you, you pay them, you pay them. But boy, when we hit 50 years, if this is still going on, everybody's free. Bye. <laughs> and that's it. No more burden. Um, so that's what the year of Jubilee is about. Um, if I'm missing something, please jump in there for me. And I think just from a New Testament point of view is how Jesus forgives our debts when we come to him. John, you had a question? Wait, wait, he's going to give you the mic because we can't hear you. Huh. That's a great question. Well, yeah, um, he, well, that, and, and I, I said that with, with Luba, you know, you, it's the thought, somebody's sick, you could pray for them 10 times a day. You're going before the Lord and you say, that person's sick and it's breaking my heart. Um, when it comes to the Our Father or the act of contrition, there's really no goal. And sometimes with organized religion, you say those things so that you can be absolved of your sins. Now you have a bad connection because 1 John 1, 9, right? right? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Only God can cleanse us from sin. Saying a prayer over and over and over again, first of all, you're not, you're not conveying anything to the Lord. You're just memorizing and repeating. Remember, Jesus talked about in vain, like a mantra, versus versus you, you listen sometimes in in romans 8 right it's the spirit who makes intercession you ever been so depressed so bummed out that you just you just say lord and you can't say anything else it's cool because god knows the heart and and that's actually great because somebody asked <laughs> somebody asked a follow-up question does it have to be out loud or is the prayer in your head the same I love this. These are great questions. Um, there are sometimes, one second. There are sometimes that 
let's say you're in, in, a crowd, in a room of crowded people, and there's times that I've prayed, I'm in a room of crowded people, and they're strangers, and I, I pray. I don't say it out loud because people look at me, and they're like, I would say in my, in my head, Lord, um, give me an opening. Help me, to, help me to understand these people and help me to, you know, strike up a conversation. So the, the last person who, t- who tagged on to it, um, you know, that's, that's, that's a really neat thing. So it could be either way. You could say it out loud. You could say it in your head. And either way, it's good with the Lord. Or corporately, right? We have corporate prayer. We pray together, right? As long as it's from the heart, as long as it means something. So, and, and I just want to... You know, I'm, I'm dealing with people over the last few weeks that are really emotionally distraught, either through our culture or through a marriage that failed or through um, a situation with their kids, um, maybe looking back at their life. You know, you ever hear of midlife crisis? There's a little truth to that. Um, you know, you, when you get it to be a certain age, you look back and you wonder, what did I do wrong? How am I in this place? You know, you give that to God because he's the one who can lift you back up. And listen, maybe the circumstances aren't good, but, but he's there for you, you know? So I just want to encourage you with that. God knows. You could just, it doesn't have to be a prayer of substance. You can just be, you know, just pouring your heart out and your feelings to the Lord. He's, he understands. And I've been in counseling sessions where people... They're crying, they're screaming, they're, and it's okay. I'm not saying, well, you know, you're not saying anything of substance. You know, there's an emotional component that needs to be ministered to. Anybody else? <laughs> Let's see. All right, so... Uh, I, I think we're going to, I think it's time, right? Because we don't have all that much time left. So, uh, Pastor Sam's going to come up with me, and uh, we're going to talk about, you know, here's the funny thing. Well, it's actually not funny, but when you look at a society, you know, we've been through a lot in American culture in the last four months, and it's just been one thing after another where it's almost like you're asking, Okay, when everything calms down with what's going on now, what's going to happen next? So I, I'm just going to tee it up and have Pastor Sam come up. But, you know, it started off with the COVID thing, and people, Christians were frightened. Of course, you watch TV, and everyone's going to die, and millions of us are going to die, and, of course, that didn't happen. But, um, you know, the fear that's out there, the un- instability, the uncertainty, the new normal, so to speak. So you had the COVID thing. Then you had the lockdowns. You know, the governor announces... Um, you know, nobody can leave their house and you can't gather, you can't open your stores. And that caused a lot of sadness. And you see these, these waves, right? And that was tough because people were losing their jobs. They were losing their businesses. They still may be. Um, they can't get unemployment. Then one thing I said was very interesting uh, a while back I, when I saw the videos of and it, it, the police were put in, in a really tough position because they were ordered by, you know, the Blasio or Murphy or whoever to um, write people tickets if they're in the park. Or, you know, I saw a video of the police pushing, literally pushing everybody out of Central Park because they had a social distance. And one of the things I said from this pulpit is, oh, this isn't a good look for law enforcement. You know, and I always talked about, I was, as a former police officer, how it ebbed and flowed. You know, we were heroes under 9-11. And then 10 years later, these videos came out and we were the enemy. And then uh, a terrorist attack or something comes up. We're heroes again. COVID comes up. Law enforcement's heroes. And then something like the George Floyd video, which was a tragedy. And then, you know, we're, you know, it's like you're, you're up and you're down all the time when you're in law enforcement. Um, So that was, to me, the whole George Floyd thing was a spark. There was already a lot of buildup in our culture. People were, they were unemployed, you know, the, African-American unemployment was really low. They were doing really well, and then they, they had a lockdown. And, and then you have the, the protests, and some turn into riots, and now people can't even go back to work because their businesses are burned down. So, you know, when, when somebody says to me, what's, what's the answer? 
I guess the question is, to which problem, you know what I'm saying? Um, so I guess we're on the subject of the police, and now we're on the subject of race, and in a week, the news will put us on another subject and another crisis. But I think as pastors, you know, I would just say this as Christians, is that what we say, and, and this is the litmus test, are we making the problem worse by what we say, causing more inflammation and more anger and, and hard feelings, or are we making the situation better? Because I'm hearing a lot of people, even with clergy titles, that are inflaming things. And there are voices out there. I love listening to Alveda King and uh, niece of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and uh, some other voices that are they're so calming. And that's what I want to be. So I want to kind of turn it over to Pastor Sam a little bit. And um, I'll sit down next to him. We're going to be all comfortable in these chairs. <laughs> and uh, just uh, I always say that, Pastor Sam, whenever you speak from the heart, whenever you speak from the spirit, it's always, it's always a blessing to us. So why don't you jump in? Which <laughs> we didn't have to move that. Yeah. <laughs> it's almost like I haven't seen this place in years been so long and I thank God that uh, I see a lot of familiar faces and that you're doing well. This uh, person sitting next to me here, our senior pastor, called me a few, a few days ago and uh, wanted me to come up and, and, and share some things. He says, I don't care what you share, whatever the Lord puts on your heart to share. Well, that, to most pastors, is like something you never say. So, uh, but I've been praying since then and asking God, you know, what, what do you want from me? What do you want to share with me? And I, my mind went back to, some years ago, over, over 50 years ago, when God actually called me into the ministry. Uh, I know a lot of you don't really know, but I've been ordained by three different churches. I've been, you know, with the oil and the laying on of hands and the whole thing. I've never asked to be ordained. God has... Uh, opened up those doors for me. And I, since I've been called into the ministry, I, I actually have been a part of five different churches, uh, only one of which was a predominantly black church. And that church had all kinds of problems. But we never went looking for a church that was like I was, you know, in color. We only wanted to go where the Lord wanted to take us. And the interesting part about Calvary Chapel here is when I first started coming to Calvary Chapel, this church was meeting in South Brunswick and was meeting in a schoolhouse in South Brunswick. When I was called into the ministry, I was a member of a church in Heightstown, New Jersey called Mount Olive Baptist Church. And due to some circumstances there, God separated myself and my family from that church and we didn't know where we were going to go, and we just looked around to try to find a place to go, and we saw this place in South Brunswick, and 
It was called Liberty Tabernacle. It met in the very same schoolhouse where this church first started from. And after the first Sunday we were there, you know, I said to my wife, I said, isn't this interesting? God has brought us around full circle. We've been part of four other churches since we've been to this building. And he brought us all the way back. And God did something in me when I saw this man right here. God told me, I want you to, to, to be a part of him. Yes, he's the pastor, but God called me not to this church, but he called me to this man. I don't know how much you guys, I know some of you really know him, have been around him, but over the years, I don't know how many years, we, how, long, how long have you been here? <laughs> um, so what happened was we, we've been here 10 years, and you, 10 years. and you and Carolyn were in the school for a year or two? About a year. So I know you about so 12 years. So that's about 11. And by the way, I didn't know he was going to say that. <laughs> um, this is why senior pastors don't uh. say just speak. But Pastor Sam, if I could interject, is... You know, he's a blessing to this church, and they go all around ministering to people, and uh, they've been a blessing to my wife and I personally, and we've been to their house where they've prayed over us. Um, so there is a, I, I, I love that God puts us in a family because he is, I guess, age-wise and also years in the Lord, he's a father figure to me. Can, can you, can you no. see the, can you see the resemblance? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but see, that's what God does, you know, yeah. and, and, you know, I know you're going to get to that point, but, you know, people talk about race and the world teaches race. I, I got origin of the species here. I ordered some of Darwin's books that I'm, it's painful to, for me to read through these books. They're so fatalistic, but, you know, the Bible has a picture of that we're one family of God. But the world, academia uses this, the public schools use this, and we wonder why we have problems with racial issues is because the Bible's trying to teach us that we're all one, and when we kill each other, we're killing family members. But the world is teaching that we are separate, and we've evolved separately, and we have to struggle, literally, against each other to see who's going to win. So hence, Satan is the type of person that he gets two people to fight on the playground. He riles them up, talks to them in different classes, and then when they come together and they fight and it becomes a, a whole schoolyard brawl where people have to go to the hospital, he slinks away or blames them for the fight. And that's what he does. And that's what I see happening in our culture. So I'm glad you brought that up so, so we have a bond, but I want you to continue. <laughs> You know, I don't know what you're going to say next, well, but we'll see. I don't either, but we'll <laughs> oh, see. <shit. laughs> The term reconciliation jumped out at me a couple of days ago, and it simply is God's process of restoring us unto himself, back to himself. Reconciliation means that he uh, restores the friendship that he created us for to be with him. He created us to be friends with himself. He wanted you and he wanted me to be that individual he could love, he could uh, trust. And very often we, we have not uh, been as trustworthy as we should have been and all of us have been there and we've we know we just have to get on our knees and say lord i'm sorry forgive me but uh the bible tells teaches us that he is no respecter of persons in other words he doesn't look at you and look at me and see 
really any differences. He wants us all to have that relationship with himself. And he doesn't see a black man. He doesn't see a man of color. He doesn't see a white man. He doesn't see a Caucasian, whatever that word means. He sees a created being that was created to love on him. The Bible teaches that even before we were even born, that's why it's such a tragedy now to know what this country has done to the unborn. He knew us. Not only that, he had ordained us to be of a certain type of individual. We all have something to do. We all should be reconciled to him every day to realize that he has a special task for us today. Sometimes that task is to say hello to somebody who's really hurting. Sometimes that task is to give our last dime to someone who really needs it. You know, we just don't know. If we ask him, he will tell us when we need to know it. I like the term racial reconciliation. That means racially, black, white, colored, African-American, you know, so many terms have been used to, to identify us in the world. But in Christ, you know what God says? You're either Jew or Gentile. In other words, you either accept his son, become adopted into his family, therefore we are then Jew. Gentile, he used the term Gentile as one who did not accept Jesus Christ, one who is outside of the family of God. And I'm so glad that he called me one day and I was about five years old when he did, and he called me. I was sitting in a little church in Heightstown, and my foster sister, who was in the church choir, and they would sing every Sunday, and there was a, a number of young women and a couple young men who was in that choir, and the I don't know if you know the term the Holy Spirit falling on a group of people. In other words, a group of people have yielded themselves to the Spirit of God to where the Spirit of God takes control over their lives and their actions. And that's what happened this Sunday. And about eight or ten young teenage people, my foster sister was one, just started crying uncontrollably and coming up to the front and gave their lives to Jesus. And I, I remember turning to my mom who was sitting right next to me and I said, I want to go up. And I started crying. My mother tells me, I was only about five years old. And she says, no. She said, you're not, you don't quite understand. There'll be a time for you. And I remember... That was etched in my mind from that point on. And even as a young teenager, I couldn't wait to the point, to the time when my mother allowed me to come up and give my life to Jesus. I was reconciled that day back to the Lord. He restored me to real fellowship, real friendship with himself. Um, so when, I just wanted to clarify something with the audience. When you talked about Jew and Gentile, now it's very interesting that God had made that distinction. Now it's, you know, are you reconciled to Christ or are you not? 
Jew and Gentile are, can be in that fold. So back in the day, again, today the world is focusing on your skin color, characteristics, things that don't mean anything, race, you know, that kind of stuff. But when God made that designation between Jew and Gentile, that had nothing to do with your physical characteristics. That had to do with your spiritual health. Right. Huge difference, how God sees things and how the world sees things. God doesn't care if you're black or white or you speak different languages or you, know, you eat different foods or whatever the, the, the case may be. So a Jew was somebody before Christ who understood who the monotheistic one God was, is, and the Gentiles um, had a, a pantheon of gods, whether you're Greek, Roman, you know, Baal worship, whatever, um, you know, the um, Philistines and the sea gods and all that kind of stuff. So, so you can see the difference between how God sees the world, right? He sees things in, you know, are you mine? Are you with me? Or are you distant? Are you estranged from me? Our silly culture sees skin color and characteristics of the body and such which because our culture is a decadent culture and it's a, it's a non-spiritual and ungodly culture. So it focuses on things in the physical realm where God focuses on things in the spiritual realm because to him, in the end, the only thing that's going to be left is God and people. <laughs> None mm. of this stuff. So that's why he focuses on that. And what we have to do is we have to help the world see that physical characteristics are just a distraction that we need to focus on the things that God focuses on. Are you reconciled to Christ or are you not? And if you're not, would you like us to help you get there? Yes. Right? Yes, I, I like to think of it this way. God is colorblind. He could care less what your skin looks like. He wants to, he looks and judges us on our hearts. And when we give them to him, he begins to create through us, the relationship with others around us. You know, let me just give you a quick little story. It has to do with when I was about five years old. It was before this other incident happened, but I remember there was a little young girl in my neighborhood, just a few houses away from me. Her name was Sue. And she was about my age, and every day she'd go uh, to school, and I would go to school. We didn't go to the same school. She was Jewish. And, uh, but when we, she came home and I came home, we would always play together. She was my, my best friend at that time. We lived out in the country, so there weren't too many houses around us. But it was right around this time of year, beginning of June, this particular year, and, and she came home, and when she came over to my house to play, she said, Sam, she says, uh, I'm all excited. She says, this summer I'm going to camp, sleepaway camp. And she made it sound so great. I said, oh, that's good. I said, well, well I'll, I'll ask my mother, I'll go with you. And she said, oh, no, you can't go. I said, what do you mean I can't go? I can go. She said, no, you can't go. I said, why? She said, because you're black. I had never heard that term before in my life. My parents never spoke of color, anything like that in our house. And I said, sure I can. I started crying. And she says, well, I'm going home. And I went in the house. As soon as I get in the house, my mother saw me and she says, Sam, what is, what's wrong with you? What's, wh why are you crying? What happened? And I revealed the story to her. I says, and she said I couldn't go because I was black. My mother started laughing. Why would she start laughing? She says, oh, and she grabbed me and hugged me. She says, Sam, well, they called me Sammy back then. But she says, Sammy, you are black. <laughs> I said, no, I'm not. She says, yeah. And then she started explaining to me the differences. And 
up to that point, I never noticed a difference in people. And that's the way our God is. He doesn't notice the difference in you and I as far as color is concerned. He wants to know you. He wants to know your heart. And that's what he wanted out of me. And that was like the beginning of a lot of things that happened. I could, I could share with you 10 hours of stories of things that happened in my life that has led me to this point in my life. But the basic thing is that since that day I gave my life to the Lord, he has never, ever let me go. He's done things in my life and through my life that has caused me to know that he's been right there. I remember when he called me into the ministry, I had been married maybe maybe a year, maybe two years. I was teaching school in Carteret, New Jersey. We were living in Matawan, so I had a good half an hour, 35 minute drive on a good day, every day. And I had been a part of a group called Full Gospel Businessmen. And it was during that meeting that month that one of the speakers came down and walked and got right in front of me and he says, you've been called into the ministry. You've been called to preach. And I looked at him and something inside me said, he's telling the truth. And I didn't know how to deal with that. The church I I was belonging to at that particular time was going through a leadership change. The former pastor had had been uh, known to become a uh, an adulterer, really, and the church itself had asked him to leave. Now they were in the middle of interviewing different people, you know, having them come and preach on Sundays and everything else. And the one thing God told me, because I was a deacon in that church at that time, God told me, He said, Sam. You're not to be a part of that. You are not to be a part of that. My father was the head deacon, so he really ran the services, and he would have me there to support him. I would open up the services and a lot of things. And um, I cried out to the Lord. I said, Lord, what do you want me to do with this calling? I know he's telling the truth. And God really didn't give me an answer yet. So the next morning... I got in my car, I was coming to work. I said, Lord, give me a sign. Give me something that I can really hold on to. From the time I left my house in Matawan to the time I pulled into the parking lot in Carteret, New Jersey, I don't remember one minute even after I pulled into the parking lot, I cannot remember, and I did not remember one minute of the travel. And I had to travel on Route 34. And you know how heavy 34 can get, especially in the mornings. Um, I had to go through Rawway, and not Rawway, but um, what's the name of the town just south of Perth Amboy? You know, and as I drove into the parking lot, and parked my car, all of a sudden, it was like I awakened. And I looked around, and the Lord says, don't forget what I just did to you. And that's what he gave me to let me know that the calling was for real. Every church I've been called to since that time, and I told you I've been part of five, every single one of them, I didn't go there. The very first Sunday I ever went to those churches, the senior pastor of that church came to see me. Most of them I didn't even know, had never met before. But they came right after service, 
stood right in front of me and says, we want you to be a part of our ministry here. And most of them I said, well, wait a minute. I don't know if I <laughs> can be a part. And every last one of them, within a year, year and a half, one of them took over a year and a half, every last one of them, I was part of their, their ministry. I didn't come here looking to be part of this ministry. It's all his fault. Well, but I know it was the Lord. I saw it was actually his wife, Carolyn, was coming <laughs> first. Yes, she did. And then she was always by herself. And then I see one Sunday mm -hmm. a man with a, a full black <laughs> leather. I remember it. He looked like, like a gunslinger in the Clint Eastwood movie. From, from top to the bottom, he had this black leather. Trench, know, what do they call trench, them? Trench coat. Or That's whatever. it, trench coat. Yeah. So... Uh, like I, I still have that coat, by the way. <laughs> I'm, I'm like, let me, let me go meet that guy. Uh, <laughs> so, but it's been, uh, it was love at first sight. You know, amen. we, uh, it certainly was. you know, we had a kindred spirit and, and God, you know, a church, a church that's trying to obey God, he will put people in that church to, to help, to lift the arms in a spiritual way. And it doesn't mean that, um, you know, Pastor Sam's running around the building putting roofs on and stuff like that. It just means that, and, and God has blessed us with people like that. Um, so a church needs a little bit of everything. And he just, you know, when Heather and I went through a really tough time, not, not in our marriage, but in external circumstances, mm -hmm. like we would just go to their house. And, and uh, it, it does help that both of our wives are Philly girls. Yes, they are. Philadelphia. <laughs> so that was a connection right there. You said that helps? Was it? Did you, did it doesn't help us. <laughs> it doesn't help us, but it helped uh, them. <laughs> well, come September, it'll be 54 years for me, so that's been a real blessing. Spicy Philly girls, I right? I tell you, spicy is right. So. But, uh, you know, God laid him, he and Heather, on our hearts. And I remember one particular time he laid on Carolyn, our, my heart, to call them and have them come over to our house because God says to us, Carolyn, separately than me, but to both of us, I want you to wash their feet. And we didn't tell them what we were going to do. We just asked them to, to come to our house. And... Uh, you know, I still remember that day. <laughs> you know, we were thinking, we were going through a tough time in the church, and we were thinking, oh, no, don't tell me the Turners are leaving the church, too. <laughs> That's so but, funny. Uh, so was, I think that was the first thing Heather said. Are you going to tell us that you're leaving the church? <laughs> yeah, that, that was. That was. That was so funny. But... Uh, so I, I want him to come here and talk about race, and he just... See, that's the type of person he is. So when, when I call him up, Pastor Sam talks about the things that are important. And he, boy, if, if they would just put him on TV and just <laughs> let him bring that peace and it just that soothing, that spiritual, you know, it's, there's just so many divisive voices. There's so many just getting people whipped up into a frenzy. And I always say this, if we can do it in the church, then we can export it. So, you know, the world needs to look inside this building and see that we can get along and we're very different. I, I said something, you know, I found, I've, something just led me to the ministry application. We have the, we've had the same ministry application for about 16 years and I started just flipping through it. You know, if you're gonna work with the kids, you gotta submit to a background check you know, your date of birth, you know, it's a voluntary thing. But if you're going to work with kids, you got to be, get a check done. Mm -hmm. and, and it's funny, I'm, I'm flipping through this thing and it's something that I developed. And it, it, I kind of have to laugh because we're having this discussion as a country about race. The one thing that's not on a ministry app, because it's not important, race. I ask you <laughs> if you're married. I ask you if you're a, a believer in Christ, if you've been baptized. We have all these questions we never ask about race. 
because it's, it's, it's unimportant. You know, to me, somebody writes out a, an application and, and I, Christine gives it to me. I don't say, what race were they? It's not on here. I just see, what do they want to do? Where do they want to serve? Will they submit to a background check? And, and then I can't wait to meet them. I'm like, let me put the face to the name. So it's just not, these things are just not necessary. Do you, do you have a heart for the Lord? Do you have a heart for the lost? Do, do you want to help us? Do you want to join with us? You know what I'm saying? Some things just never come up because they're just not important. God has made me colorblind too from a very early age and I thank God for that because when I see a lot of my friends who come over to my house and we, we can share Jesus with each other, that's a real blessing to me. And uh, Carolyn and I both are very blessed to have met and have known the people that we've known all these years. Many people are here in this church who uh, he's really blessed us to get to know, to get to be a part of, and I thank him for that. I really do. You know, Pastor Paul, Pastor Vinny, you guys are really blessed to have them in your congregation. And I know you know that you can call on them and, and lean on them anytime you need. You need spiritual guidance, you need whatever. They're always there and they're always willing. And even their wives, you know, Claire, Maria, love you too. <laughs> But I thank God that he had us, you know, become part of this congregation. We see God's hand in a lot of you doing a work, you know, to, to causing you to become even stronger in your faith. And I thank God for that. Just know that when you stand before the Lord, as all of us will, the only thing he's going to want to know is what did you do with my son? Nothing else really matters. Do you seek his guidance and everything? Do you read his, his word? Do you apply his word to your life? You know, God's word is sufficient for any and all of the problems you ever have. It speaks about everything you go through because he, the Lord Jesus Christ, has experienced everything you're ever going to go through. And he can lead and guide you into all truths. Put your faith in him and he will keep you strong through whatever you have to go through. Um, I rambled. I'll let him go. No, that's good. <laughs> um, so I don't know what you're going to say and you don't know what I'm going to say. <laughs> just, uh, keep, just keep the Turners in your prayer. You know, they have a, a very, they have a very um, interesting ministry. Um, they go to a lot of wakes and funerals and comfort people, comfort the bereaved. They've gone out of state many times. And uh, just keep their health in prayer. I'll just leave it at that. I, I've asked Appreciate Pastor that. Sam, and just so you know, <laughs> I know you, it, it was almost like pulling teeth to get him out here. Um, <laughs> but I've said I want him to teach at the pulpit. And uh, I think there's some physical limitations um, because I used to love when he would come and fill in the pulpit for me. So it isn't for lack of me trying, but just keep the family in prayer and um, just for more healing and strength and, and things of that nature. Amen. And then if, if that happens, I'm, I'm roping you in again, Pastor Sam. <laughs> I'm not letting you go. Well, I just want those who are here just to have a little glimpse of my family. I have two sons and two daughters. 
my oldest child turns 51 on Sunday. And I know I told you that I'd be here this Sunday, but I just got a phone call from my son-in-law. And they live in Malvern, Pennsylvania, and he wanted me and my family to come and help celebrate her 51st birthday because a week after her birthday, she and her husband will celebrate their 25th wedding anniversary. So I think he's going to sort of combine the two. So I know I told you I was going to be here, but I guess the Lord has different plans. So. Well, that's the beautiful thing because it was almost like a last minute thing where I thought, why don't you, why don't you come in on you a know, Wednesday, right? So this turned out perfect. As soon as you said that, the scripture just came across my mind. All things work together mm -hmm. for good. You know, and, and things like that have always happened in my life. Always happened in my life. And I thank God that he's the one who orchestrates all these things. I had no idea that I wouldn't. I was looking forward to coming and being a part of the service this Sunday. Uh, I know he wanted me to come last Sunday, but I told him I think that I need to wait another week. Well, the Lord says you can wait two weeks. So, so I, I busted his chops and said, <laughs> you got to come, you got to speak. And he, his, his response to my nagging was, Joe, the Lord put you in my life for a reason. So, <laughs> so it isn't for lack of trying. Yes, he did. Yes, anyway. he did. Okay. All right. Anybody have any questions or? Oh, there's a question on the phone. I didn't want to be rude and look on the phone when it looked like I wasn't paying attention, although I'm very good at multitasking. Um, okay, so let's end it with this, and then uh, we'll pray, okay. and then we'll, uh, that'll be it. So a brand new person listening for the first time asked the question when evangelizing, if someone asked you, why is God allowed to judge? How would you respond to that? Great question, and I'm glad you asked it, because the difference between a lot of things that we can't do but God can is the fact that he's righteous, the fact that he's pure, the fact that he's unbiased, the fact that he's, you know, he's omniscient, he knows all things. You know, we, the Bible's clear that we shouldn't judge each other, even in the church, even though we have the Spirit of God, we shouldn't judge each other because we are still subject to sin and flaws and we could really hurt somebody. But God can judge. Now, let me, let me take a step back. The word judge, whether you look in the Greek or the Hebrew, it has a very wide semantic range. Some words have one or two meanings. Judge has about probably 50 meanings. And it can be as simple as judging a pie contest at a 4-H fair all the way to sending somebody to hell. Um, so when we talk about judging, we have, to, we have to make sure that we're saying this in context. Um, as Christians, we can judge simple things. We can judge matters, disputes within the church so they don't have to go to the heathen courts. The Apostle Paul talks about that. But for the big things, we, including pastors, cannot judge. Only God knows the heart. He knows who's saved. He knows who's not saved. And when, as we're in the book of Revelation, if you're following us, um, when those Revelation judgments come, they're righteous judgments because it comes from God and nobody else. So I hope I answered that um, to your satisfaction. And uh, if anybody wants to, anybody have a follow-up to that? The only thing God has commanded us to do is to love one another. Love covers a multitude of sins. And if we love one another, God will do the drawing, will cause us to come together and become unified in Him. So we just want to love each other. He even says to, to love the one who does bad things to us. <laughs> 
Not easy. No, not easy. <laughs> but he'll, he'll get us through those times. And I thank him for that. Do you want to close this out in prayer? Would love to. Father in heaven, we just thank you, Father, for this time, for those who thought it important to come out and be a part. The faces we see out here, we just pray that they receive from you that which they came looking for. Some had real questions to ask, and they did, and others just came to to be fed by whatever you through your spirit would feed them. And I thank you, Lord God, that you are not a respecter of persons, that you love us. You even loved us so much that while we were yet sinners, you sent your son to die and shed his blood for us. Help us to understand that fully, Lord God, the sacrifice that your son made. And I thank you, Lord God, for this day and for this night and for all those who you set in ministry right here. And I pray that you would provide for each one of them all that they stand in need of. We look to please you with all the things in our life. Bless you, Lord God, and bless each one who's come tonight. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before we wrap it up, before you shut off the live stream, um, tomorrow, <laughs> so for those who are watching, who are here, you know that we're at Calvary Chapel. Um, we kind of were an offshoot of Calvary Chapel, Old Bridge, Pastor Lloyd. Um, they're on the bridge radio. So Pastor Lloyd, it just was a great idea. He said, you know, the, the news, and they're putting these narratives out, and they're making people suspicious of each other, the whole racial tension thing. He goes, we as Christians need to get out ahead of this. So he asked me, I used to be a police officer, and uh, Pastor Ray Dash Jr., he's a young African-American uh, pastor in Newark, and our church supported them for many, many years, helped them to get on their feet. Um, so we're going to have, like, Pastor Lloyd is going to kind of be the moderator, and he's going to ask us about our experiences. So it's going to be really, really cool. So that's going to happen tomorrow. It's going to be recorded Saturday. If you go on the www.ithinkbridge.org, I'll, I'll get all the details. It's going to be put up. The video will be put up on the website. So I'm excited for tomorrow because I hope with their audience that, you know, we, we want to bring healing. We want to bring unity. We want to bring understanding. So I'm so looking forward to it. And, and Pastor Ray he and I are kindred spirits, you know what I'm saying? We're both passionate. Um, he's a little younger than me, <laughs> so, but we have, we have a lot of fun. We get together. He's preached in our church. I've preached in his church in Newark, and it's been wonderful. So um, that's where I'll leave it. Details to follow. Good night. <laughs>